Hey y'all, and welcome to my series about D&D. In this series, I will try to cover specific abilities, skills, and mechanics that players and DMs may have questions about. Many times, new players and veteran players alike will use an ability or a feature wrongly, on accident, or completely in ignore an aspect of the game due to not understanding it. Sometimes it's simply because the wording is weird, or there's a line that everyone forgets. It's an understandable mistake. This series should help with those rules. I hope you find this video helpful, and if so, please be sure to like and share this video with your fellow nerds. Good day, my fellow nerds. Today, we will be talking about running a session zero. I'm going to be honest, I'm surprised to hear that there are still tables that skip this step. Frankly, even if you've been playing with the same group for 20 years, you can benefit from a session zero. Session, zero, session zeros are a pre-campaign meetup. Uh, it originated from character creation nights back in the old days. And now it's even been officially recognized in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. With session zeros, you can prevent a lot of awkwardness that can happen early on in a campaign. Um, a few examples that I have experienced myself are going to be two players trying to fill the same role in the party and constantly stepping on each other's toes. Uh, having two melee builds that just go up into combat and keep trying both be the beat down, leaving holes in the party, but also trying to fill the same one and be, being disheartened by constantly having to compete with their own party members. Um, creating a well-structured, fleshed-out character that isn't built for the campaign's theme. Your character has fly speed? Well, this is a dungeon crawl campaign with one giant dungeon. That fly speed it isn't really going to help. Or you created this super awesome character, but it has sunlight sensitivity, and this entire campaign is overland outdoors. Uh, another issue you run into is conflicting backgrounds or character arcs. Maybe everyone has a character arc that just doesn't apply to the other characters. So now you have to run six individual arcs and sometimes that can get a little overwhelming, especially if none of them tie in together. Or if you have basically a cop in the group and a thief, how does that work out? If you guys didn't discuss it, discuss it beforehand and you just try figuring it out at the table, it gets messy. So I have prepared a short PowerPoint presentation kind of thing to discuss this hope you appreciate it. Session zero. We're going to discuss meeting the players, the adventure, DM rules or fiat, the logistics of it all, and then creating your character. So let's go ahead and hit this meet the player stage. This is a crucial step, especially if you've never played with any of the individuals in the group. Got to familiar, familiarize yourself with each other, right? Talk about your experience levels. Do you have newbies at the table? Do you have veterans that are looking to do something weird because they've been playing for 30 years? Talk about your preferred play styles. Is someone looking just to show up, smash, and then hang out with friends? Is another player here for the mystery, want to solve puzzles? Does someone just want to play a bunch of mini games? It's it's extremely important to figure out what everyone's goals are in the campaign. This is a big one that I don't see a lot of. Favorite or least favorite aspects of the game. Do you hate solving puzzles? Do you love solving puzzles? If you have both those people at your table, it's important for you as the DM to know that. If four out of five people love solving puzzles, maybe that fifth person can deal with it 
or just he won't have interest when puzzles come into play, or he may just want another table to play at. Again, no D&D is better than bad D&D, and if you're not enjoying yourself, you really should find another table. This is why Session Zeroes exist. Finding out if you and the table synergize. Now, just because you don't like puzzles and other players do doesn't mean you can't play at a table that involves puzzles. It just means if the entire campaign's built around puzzle solving and mystery, that might not be your forte. If there's a few here or there, I'm sure you could both enjoy the campaign. So here are some hypothetical players. Uh, the pictures in this were the default pictures and names with the PowerPoint template I used for Microsoft PowerPoint. So we have Takuma. He loves role play and social aspect of the game. In the party role, he wants to fill as the negotiator. We'll get to party roles later. I meant to add that in the slide before this one, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Then we have Miriam. Combat. That's what she's here for. She wants to be the frontline fighter. Flora wants a healthy balance of role play, social play, a little bit of combat, but wants to play the infiltrator slash explorer. And then Rajesh. Problem solving. Looking to play the investigator role. So far, a good party. No one's stepping on each other's toes. No one's trying to fill in holes that the other one's already trying to fill. And they all want interesting things in this campaign. But none of them want the same thing completely. Everyone wants the same thing. Everyone wants a healthy balance, right? Everyone wants combat. Everyone wants some role play, some social, some problem solving. This is what their favorite part of the game is. Now this is the part where we're going to talk about preparing, sitting down and actually deciding the setting, deciding the adventure. We're looking at the world. Is it a homebrew world? Is it an official world from Wizards of the Coast? Is this third party content? Is it a created world like Wildmount or something similar? What's the theme of your world? Are you doing overworld travel? Are you going to be in an underdark adventure? Are you going to be seafaring pirates? Are you going to be in space? These are all good questions and they all matter because when it comes to creating a character, these are things you need to know. Because nothing is more disappointing than creating a character that can breathe underwater like a triton and then the entire campaign is in the woods. One of the most important parts that have to be discussed at a session zero are house and table rules. Changes to the game have to be discussed before they come up at the table. Because if the change is presented at the table, it automatically stops whatever you're doing. If you're in the middle of combat and there's a spell that the players use and the DM did not want that spell to work the way it does rules as written, we now need to stop combat, talk about it, and have a discussion. Because yes, the DM has the final say, but this is a group game. So the DM just doesn't dictate laws about the game and then everyone just agrees you can give a little bit of pushback or justification or maybe ask for clarification all of this kills a session if it comes up in the middle of one so you want to discuss as much of it up front as you possibly can fumble tables are a big one if i roll a natural one do i just fail or do i shoot my ally in the foot i would like to know that what's the ruling on critical damage are we 
Are we following the rules as written? Are we bumping them up? Are you nerfing it? Are we running the inspiration system? What kind of things can we do to get inspiration? And any other modified rules. One personally that I run at my table, health potions heal for the average. If you get a regular healing potion, they heal you for 7 HP. This was a decision my table came to unanimously after a campaign in which every time our wizard drank a health potion or was healed by someone else's healing spells, they rolled double ones. Mm, it was rough. So that's the house rules. Let's get to the DM fiat, which is kind of a subsection of house rules. Things the DM wants to ban, like spells, need to be discussed at the session zero. Shield, counterspell, banishment. Ah, uh, man, I'm drawing a blank. I'm sure there's another one. Uh, but I've seen these spells completely outright banned. Um, I've also seen them uh, adjusted in a way. Either their spell level goes up or they do less than what the text says. This is something you need to know in session zero. It's also not expected that your DM knows every spell and how every spell works to discuss it. So if, you, if you're if you going through as a spellcaster, if you're planning on playing a spellcaster and you're picking spells and you find one that's just super awesome that you're going to take, run it by the DM. Because the reason it's super awesome is because it's good. Maybe too good. Or maybe it directly steps on the toes of the campaign plan. Being able to cast Remove Curse to get rid of Lycanthropy could be a huge hole in the storyline that the DM didn't think about. If that's the case, maybe he has to DM Fiat that Lycanthropy is, isn't removed by the Remove Curse spell. Uh, species. This is a big thing. Uh, a lot of species that have flight get banned. Uh, powerful species with magical resistance, like satyrs, get banned. yan are just ridiculously powerful species. Some DMs do ban them. Last thing you want to do is show up for game night, for session one, present your character, and then your DM is like, whoa, wait, those don't exist in my world. Or you don't have flight until level five. Again, you this is something to talk about at session zero, but there's also something you can give a little pushback on. A fix I have seen is DM saying, I don't allow flying species at my table. But players then rebuttaling with, what if my wings are injured at the beginning of the session campaign and it takes a long time for them to recover maybe five levels worth of time wink wink and the dm will sometimes say okay subclasses um or classes in general artificers they are not in the player handbook for a reason, because they are setting specific. Artificer may grade against the theme of the campaign that we talked about earlier. It may not lore-wise make sense for the Artificer to exist. Or it could go against what some of the other players are trying to build thematically. So the DM may ban it. There are other subclasses that the DM may just find a burden to deal with in play or that other players have decided they don't like other players picking up i've been at a table where the dm didn't ban any subclasses but other players requested that no one take twilight cleric even as a multi-class dip just because it's got some strong abilities i've actually been at a table where players requested no one multi-class hexblade that if you want to play hexblade you do straight hexblade but no power building with two levels and Hexblade. This is an important one. Optional rules. There are more rules that people play with regularly that are optional rules than a lot of people think about. Like feats. These are an optional rule. 
rules as written, feats are not a given rule. They are an optional rule that the DM can agree to allow. This is very important because I love my brother to death. And, but when we were going to play D&D together and he told me he does not allow feats at his table, I said, man, it's going to be great talking to you about your campaign because I ain't going to be playing in it. I just cannot play at a table without feats. It's kind of wild, but it is an optional rule, and some people do choose to opt out of it. Another optional rule is flanking. This is going to be a big deal because if the entire theme of your rogue is dual wielding for that sneak attack and hoping to get advantage by coming in and flanking in melee, well, flanking is an optional rule. And if you're not playing with it at your table, that's going to be a drastic change in how you play your character because now you're not going to get sneak attack by flanking because you won't have advantage. Class features. Tasha's Cauldron of Everything introduced a lot of optional class features as well as custom lineage and other things. Um, these things need to be talked about. Anything with the optional tag need to be talked about. Like I said, custom lineage, um, being able to adjust your ability scores, which is also added because if you're a mountain dwarf, you now get plus two, plus two. You can put either of those anywhere you want. A lot of people don't like that because it floods their game with mountain dwarf warrior or wizards. Customization. Some tables start with level one feeds. There are many different ways to do this. You've seen it, if you've seen anything about 1D&D, they've impl implemented level feats and they allow you to get a feat at level one. Some tables have been playing with this for a long time, mine included. The way we've run it at my table is, you present to me your backstory, your character concept, your species, and how you plan on playing the character pretty much. What, what, um, what role you're trying to fill, um, you basically present your character and their story to me as a DM. I read through it, I look it over, and sometimes I'll prevent you, I'll provide you two or three options of feats. These feats are never sharpshooter, great weapon master, or polearm master. But, could be something like cook, inspiring leader maybe. Hell, I've even been known to give out shadow touched. It's something that some DMs do that is worth talking about at level one or at session zero. Because if at level one you get a free feat, maybe the DM doesn't allow variant human because they already hand out a free feat. I know a guy. This rule was, I believe, brought to us by the Dungeon Dudes, Monty Martin and Kelly McLaughlin. When your characters are creating their characters, or when your players are creating their characters, allow them a, a free NPC. You can talk about it beforehand, and obviously it has to make sense, but if you have a character from the main city, maybe they know a merchant there. You give them a free get-out-of-jail-free card, but it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card, it's an I-know-a-guy card. Once per campaign, my players can basically create, ask for an NPC to solve a problem for them. It has to be a minor problem, cannot be the main problem of the campaign, but maybe the wizard knows, knows somebody in the local library that's researched this topic a lot. So even though the wizard failed his arcana check on this magical item, he can take it to the library and use his dude, Frank, to look it up. Class improvements. I've seen this also offered a lot, especially with Monk increasing their key points available, um, allowing certain classes to have martial features, such as um, the Forge Cleric doesn't get martial weapons. I've seen some DMs say that doesn't make sense. If you're a Forge Cleric, you get proficiency in Warhammer 
or something like that. This is, again, depending on which class you pick, the DM may offer this, but I would keep that in mind. So don't immediately say, well, I don't like monks, I'm not going to play monk. Ask the DM, hey, curious, if I pick monk, could we do something to make it a little bit more viable? Because I just don't enjoy playing it the way it is. Or the same could be said about the sorcerer. Hey, DM, I want to play sorcerer, but I don't like the spell's known concept in D&D. Can I be a prepared caster instead? Sometimes they'll say no. Sometimes they'll say yes. It's worth talking about session zero. Now, I promised you earlier, we we're going to talk about the seven roles that you have at a table when making characters. Now, not all of these roles need to be filled completely. You don't need seven characters at every table because some roles can be filled as a secondary aspect. The beatdown. Damage, damage, damage. The beatdown does damage. That is their goal. You can see more about the seven roles by referring back to, again, the Dungeon Dudes, Kelly McLaughlin and Monty Martin. They do a video about the seven character roles in D&D. It's worth a watch. It helped me really understand what I was trying to accomplish with my frontline fighter, Korndolf the Goliath. It's really hard to grab aggro in D&D. There's Compelled Duel is pretty much the only spell. Battlemaster has a maneuver. So something to keep in mind before you're taking the front line is you have to look at feats or other abilities, grappling, something that keeps the enemy on you. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to, to play the frontliner. But you, it can be satisfactory because if you're jumping into the enemy's face and hitting them, they're probably going to try and handle you. So just keep that in mind if you're making something like this, that you, you're not going to be able to just, look at me, hit me. You're going to have to do something or play in a way that forces the enemy to deal with you. Utility. Utility is a cool one because utility is of kind of makes up for the lacking parts of your party. If you have a fighter that has a low wisdom score and he's you're afraid he's going to get charmed by the enemy, a utility character would buff that fighter to prevent to help their wisdom save. Whereas the next one we're going to talk about is support. The support isn't there to make up for holds, but they're to double down on what we're good at. So whereas the utility would buff the fighter's wisdom score, that support character would cast haste on the fighter to allow them to hit more times. It's pretty that pretty much that simple. The investigator is a little bit more complex because you can have two kinds of investigators in the campaign and they wouldn't actually step on each other's toes because one can be wisdom-based and one can be intelligence-based. Being able to be perceptive and insightful versus investigative and knowledgeable, um, you could almost argue that the insightful goes to the negotiator role that we're going to talk about next, but I think it can also be used as an investigator. Um, these are usually going to be your wizards, ritual casters, or anyone with good eyes. The negotiator, the party face, the socializer. Someone who can get you a little bit more gold than posted on the bounty boards. But also, the ones that are able to trick NPCs into revealing their secrets. Infiltrator and explorer. These are going to be your scouts. These are going to be the stealthy ones. These are going to be the survivalists. These are going to be skill experts um, or skill monkeys. This is a role that you usually see filled by rogues and rangers, but it can also be filled by other, other classes and other specific subclasses. There is an arcana cleric that could fill in investigator. There is um, trickery cleric, I believe. Could it... Um, Phil Infiltrator. I believe you could see a specific kind of fighter fill the explorer role. There's just a lot of ways to fill these roles. And again, you can fill multiple roles. Your utility and support can be the same. Hell, your frontline 
and utility can be the same. Your investigator can be your negotiator. So now that we've covered what roles exist, what kind of campaign we're playing in, what the theme is, what our world is, what rules, what spells not to take, we can now build our characters. So of course, pick the roles. I would say pick two. One to be the one your character is gonna focus on and one that your character is going to do when he's not focusing on the main one. Let's talk relationships. You're building characters, but you're building a party. The other characters in the game, how does your character know them? Do you guys share backstories? What NPCs in the world might your character know? One of the characters in my current campaign specifically mentioned that her family were blacksmiths, and they did a lot of business with the dwarves in the mountains. So I've introduced a handful of dwarven NPCs that she's like, do I know them? And I've clarified, you know what? Yeah, you do. Talk about your background. Run it through the other players, the other DM. Don't give away too much. You don't want to spill all of your secrets at Session Zero. Some of them are good to keep. Not from the DM, but from the other players. But maybe, you know, oh, I'm from this quaint village out east. Oh, I wanted my character to be from a quaint village out east. Oh, we're from the same village. What are your character's goals? Why is your character going on an adventure? Where are you heading? Who are you looking for? What is, what is your goal? This can be also answered unanimously by the group. Maybe they all want to work towards the same goal. Maybe the theme of your campaign is... A demon lord broke out of his cell and is trying to take over the world. And your group is going to kill him. Or maybe there's a famous lost treasure at the bottom of the sea. And your group banded together to go find that treasure. Maybe one of the players lost their mom or was kidnapped by bandits. And they're going to recruit the other players to go join them and save their mom. And then just stick with them after that. These are all good questions to talk about. And then the final step is to create your characters. Decide your ability scores. Pick the species you're going to play. Pick the class. Do this together as a group because sometimes you don't want the same class or species playing in the same campaign. You don't want to end up with a party of all dwarves, or maybe you do. Maybe that's something you discuss where you all decide you want to play dwarves and your then mother that was watching after you guys fell ill and has gone into a coma and you now have to go to the local lord to find a cure. And there's the party connection. The party connection could also be you guys had already adventured, you shared a home, you have the same patron. This goes back to the goals and creating your characters, the background. Honestly, this just sums it all up. Why is your party together? Because if you can't answer that question, it really makes running a campaign together hard. So, now we're getting into the logistics of it. When do you guys meet for D&D? What's your schedule? I meet every Wednesday, 7 to 10 p.m. consistently. If we run out of players, if two call out, or honestly, we have a small party right now, so even if one calls out, we'll try to adjust the schedule maybe by one day before or after Tuesday, Thursday. But if that doesn't work, we usually just cancel for the next week. You got to stay consistent. If you can't meet your time, you just skip it. Where are you going to play? If you're doing it in person, is it at the DM's house or is the DM coming to you? If you're playing online, what servers are you using? Roll, well, blah, 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 blah. Roll 20, Foundry, Zoom. Again, how do you handle absences? Um, I have three players, so we just cancel. But what if we didn't cancel? What if the th other two players were like, man, we really want to play. And that third player was like, you know what? Play without me. It's fine. Does DM control that character? Do they make decisions for that character? Or... Is the character just in the background? Do we pretend like they don't exist for this session and then just next session, they're there? This is an important thing to discuss. Because the last thing you want to do is 
have your group play and you come in and they played your character a way you didn't want or they handled it in a way you didn't want. Maybe there was a situation where you think, my character really would have spoken up in this. Why didn't you have him speak up? Well, we didn't agree on how we would do it, so we defaulted to the character being in invisible. Who does what? This is mainly in person. Um, there is some online caveat. So if you're in person, who's bringing the snacks and drinks? Who's, who's bringing all the minis? Who's moving the minis? That's kind of important. When I played with a group, one guy among us was six foot four. The rest of us were under six. So when it came to reaching across the table to move a mini on the map, guess who got stuck with that job? Um, online, in one of the campaigns I played, we actually had one player that was the DJ. He would pick what songs were playing. The DM would say, roll for initiative. He, before even rolling for initiative, he would go in and grab a playlist, put it in the Discord for the bot to play, and then he'd roll initiative. These are all things that you need to discuss because it's the logistics. It's, it, it makes running your session smoother. It makes planning your session smoother because if you don't know whose house you're playing at and you're changing and you're just whose house is convenient that week, it gets a little harder. Um... If you don't talk about what server you're going to play on and you don't find out, oh, this player actually doesn't know how to use Roll20 or this player doesn't have an account on Foundry, you need to handle that before the first session. And you won't know that is an issue without a session zero. So, and that's it. That's all I've got. I tried to keep this video a little, a little shorter than the last one. It's still going to run about probably 30, 35 minutes. But I hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you found this useful, please like, comment, share with your friends. And also send me suggestions for other kind of videos you would like to see me compose. Right now I'm focusing on smaller, minor things like mechanics for specific classes or game mechanics and logistics, like how certain rules function. I'm going to stay away from power builds. I can't, I'm not going to do ranking systems of best spells for level three clerics and stuff like that. I'm going to avoid that. I'm not good at it. I'm not going to be doing the math, the numbers. If you want that, there are plenty of other channels like Treant Monks or D4. There are great channels for that. Just don't come to me for that. Come to me for more fun stuff. And that's my coverage of Session Zero. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope it was educational. Let me know what else you want. Enjoy my channel. Enjoy playing D&D. &D, and roll for initiative because an owlbear just popped out.